Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I hope you are all fine. And uh, thank you very much for creating time so that we be together in our virtual lecture and the panel discussions about uh, primates, uh, diversity, conservation status, and challenges here in Kenya. My name is Richard Kipngeno. I'm the membership and uh, boarding officer from Nature Kenya, and I will also be moderating uh, this virtual talk. So I welcome each and every one of you, and uh, uh, it will be a successful presentation. Uh, also, thank you to all the particip uh, partners who are involved in uh, planning this uh, webinar, which includes uh, the Institute of Primate Research, Nature Kenya, Kenya Wildlife Service, and National Environment Management Authority, Friends of Karura Forest, Wildlife Research and Training Institute, National Museums of Kenya, and Kenya Forest Service. Also, let me acknowledge uh, the presence of our main speaker, uh, Dr. Nancy Mwende, who is a senior research scientist and primatologist from the Institute of uh, Primate Research for accepting to give us this talk today. And also I acknowledge uh, all our panelists who are here with us, uh, starting with uh, Dr. Kimpole Hawkins from uh, Center for Ecology and Conservation from uh, University of Exeter who will be taking us through people, culture, and primate conservation. Also, uh, Dr. Masi Akini, who is a disease ecologist from the Institute of Primate Research, and she will be taking us through primate, climate change, and diseases in the context of One Health approach. Uh, our third panelist is uh, Pamela Kaniworth, who is a director, Colobus Conservation in Diani, will be taking us through conserv conserving Africa's forgotten primates in sub urban Kenya. Our fourth panelist is Dr. Stan Kivai, who is a senior research scientist and primatologist and head of primate conservation and ecology program at the Institute of Primate Research. And we also have Dr. Omar Mohammed, who is a principal scientist, marine and coastal research uh, center at the Wildlife Research and Training Institute. He will be taking us through interventions required to halt climate extinction crisis. So uh, that is a brief uh, of uh, our panelists whom we have today and the main speaker. So I will uh, request each and every one of you to remain uh, muted throughout uh, the ses session. And also to let you know that uh, the session is being recorded and we will upload to our Nature Kenya YouTube channel which you can revisit later on. And I would also encourage all the participants to raise their questions through the chat box. We will be able to go through all of them after the presentation. That is um, the last session that we have. So our first uh, session will be uh, the, the main uh, presentation from the main speaker. And then we'll go to the panelist presentation. And then the last one will be the question and answers uh, uh, sex session. So uh, I will take you through um, a short uh, brief on uh, the International Primate Day, which will be celebrated on uh, 1st of September. We've just uh, decided to create this awareness prior to the day itself. And International Primate Day, which is celebrated on September 1st every year, is dedicated to creating awareness about all primates and the need to advocate for their enhanced welfare, as well as to protect and conserve primate species that are faced with imminent risk of extinction locally, nationally, and globally. Observation of this day traces its roots in Britain, where it started in 2005 and was largely driven by the British-based animal defenders who advocated for humane treatments of primates and mitigating their risk of extinction. This year, Kenya, which is a primate range country, plans to mark this day by enhancing public awareness on primate and initiate restoration activities at core primate habitats. The theme of this year's International Primate Day is restoring forest habitats and creating awareness to mitigate conflicts and climate change for long-term survival of uh, primates. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, we will uh, go straight to our main uh, presentation from uh, our main uh, speaker, who is uh, Dr. Nancy Mwinde. And I will read through uh, a short bio that Nancy is a senior research scientist and primatologist at the Institute of Primate Research, National Museums of Kenya. 
She obtained her PhD in anthropology at Rutgers University, Master of Science in Conservation Biology from University of Cape Town, South Africa, and Bachelor's in Zoology from Paraton University in Kenya. Her research interests are in behavioral ecology and conservation, and her research work largely focuses on social and environmental resilience to better understand adaptive Res response to human and non-human primate modified ecologies and environmental changes. Dr. Nancy will give a detailed talk on primate classifications narrow to the diversity in Kenya. Borrowing from her long experience in primate research work and conservation and relying on work done in Kenya by distinguished primatologists, Dr. Nancy will present the conservation status of the Kenyan primates and the challenges facing them. She will conclude the talk by highlighting on the existing opportunities to enhance the long-term survival of primates in the Kenyan context. So ladies and gentlemen, allow me to welcome our main speaker, Dr. Nancy, on the floor. Welcome, Dr. Nancy. Uh, Dr. Nancy, uh, please unmute yourself and uh, share the screen. My apologies. No problem, now we can hear you. All right, loud and clear. I will now share. We did the sharing, but for some reason it's not um, you. Just below your screen in the share screen, the green icon. Yeah, for some reason, oh, there we are. It was not responding. Good. Can you see everything now? Yes, you can see your I'll PowerPoint put the slideshow. Yes. All right. Good, there we are. All right, I'll, st I'll start straight away with my presentation outline. And basically, I will start with, it's not moving. For some reason, it's not moving. Please bear with me. I think when we were practicing, we talked about the response. Okay, yeah, I think I got it. Yeah. It took a while. Okay, so um, I will start with a brief overview of Kenyan primate taxonomy. And I won't spend so much time on this because <laughs> my experience with teaching taxonomy in primates has not been very, uh, no matter how, which way you teach it, it doesn't always appear interesting, no matter how much you try to make it interesting. But I will highlight on the changes that have happened over the last 30 years, three decades, in which the taxonomy has changed or species genuses have been included and species shifted to different genus, genuses. And then also briefly compare it with the national versus East African, or should I say regional approach and see how Kenya is doing in terms of species diversity. There's a bit of a lag in terms of next page. So I'm doing my very best to move, but it's not. It's kind of stuck. I'm not sure how this is going to work out. Okay. So the next uh, section of my talk will be basically on Kenya endemic primate species. Uh, I decided to take this approach because we have a lot of diversity in Kenya, but I will talk more in terms of the genuses and which areas these endemic species are found. 
it's in terms of mapping them out, showing indicating about the threats and intervention of some of them that we're actually working with at IPR. And then talk about some changes in population trends. There are interesting stories about lost and found species or newly discovered populations or rediscovered ones or, or locally extinct and sadly even extinct species in Kenya. So some of you may be aware, familiar with this book, Know Your Monkey is a guide to the primates of Kenya that came out in 1989, literally more than that's literally 30 years and something ago. And if you look, compare this particular taxonomy of what was there, uh, the book published by National Museums, it actually shows there's a difference now in terms of what we, what we saw then in number of genus and species. When you look at how we, Kenya has um, had seven genus of them, now we have 11. And this is not included, I've not included, uh, basically not included human beings. This is just homo sapiens. This is just the non-human primates. So there were seven genus then, 11 genus now. Species 15, then now 18 and probably more. There's a lot of subspecies that have been included, but mainly here we're talking about species. And you see the Galago here was just a bush babies, as people, most people will call them, in the, in the, in the Lorisidae family or subfamily, you find the two genus was included, the Artenluma and the Gal goddess, which are the small, smaller ones, the dwarf Galagos, and then the Artenluma or the greater Galagos. So these were put into different genus uh, from the Galagos. And then you go across to the Sacopithecinae, and you can see that the Chlorus uh, Cebus was included there. So the varvets were actually moved from the Sacopithecine to, to have their own genus. And then in the Colobine, we find that we have the Paleocolobus, and which is where we have the red Colobus, the, particularly the Tunnel River, um, critically endangered uh, Colobine. So a brief overview of that, we have an idea of a map. And the next slide will now explain, give you an idea comparative, you know, where Kenya stands compared to the regional, you know, Burundi, Rwanda, Tanzania, Uganda, its, its neighbors in the East African region. And you can see that a total of 17 genera and a total of 38 genera, Kenya has 12 of them, the genus of a genera and 19 species. Some species are still debatable, but they are going, I'll go through briefly and I'll focus mainly on the endemic as I say, because there's too much to talk about in 20 minutes. So this is a list of at least the nine endemic species in Kenya and were really well mapped out as far back as 12, 2012 by Dijon and Putinsky and um, it shows some of the IOC and threat categories have changed since then and try to update that. But you find that the colobus, you can see the Mount Kenya Gureza, I'll just call them colobus. Uh, and then the Mount, uh, Mount Uregis Gureza, which was found in the Matthews, endangered. Tana River Red Colobus, everybody knows this is the 25 uh, most endangered species uh, primates in the world currently. And Tana River endangered. Mandra, very little is known about this. Hardly any data there. Very um, few records of, um, actually, let's just say even the last census done by Butinsky, sorry, John and Butinsky were not really seen, but we'll talk more into details about that, but evidence is from residents that are still there. So the Kolb's monkey, which is part of the Sykes, the Metis uh, species, subspecies, uh, least concern, and then we have the Mount Kenya portal, critically endangered. In fact, it's an interesting case because I don't think any sighting was done in the last surveys. I could be wrong, I can be corrected. And then the Otelima, uh, Kikuyu small eared galgo, is least concerned globally and um, found around Mount Kenya. And then we have the Galagoides, or the, the dwarf. <laughs> it's new, but. Also, the bee has been building a lot of sustainability aspects. Can you guys hear me? I hear some lot of background noise. Am I still clear? And then we have the Titan uh, Mountain yeah. Galago, which 
question whether it's it's extant, hardly ever, hardly there. So those are the list of the endemic species, and now we'll go to. There's a, we're going to more details about these endemic species. And I'll start with the, with the grazers or colobus monkeys. And the Mount Kenya one is of interest because it's basically found within this circulated area. I've tried to do my best. It's not the perfect, but this is the region roundly where it's found, within where it's found. Uh, when you compare it to the Mount Eurogis, which is found in Matthew Ranges, although I've put a big blue circle around the Mount Kenya grazer, it's not in that whole range, but it's found in pockets in that range. While the Gereza monkey in Matthew ranges is more or less continuous through that ranges, there's some pockets that are not there, but it's, uh, I think as far as we know, found within uh, throughout of the Matthew ranges in some certain high forests. Then we have the Mount Kenya colobus. And as I said, we have a special uh, uh, pockets of these, uh, uh, you know, particular Mount Kenya grazer, which is found in pockets everywhere within this region. And as you can see, the red spot is where the Institute of Primary Research in KWS have been working from uh, focusing on translocating primates, uh, these, these species there from there, because as you can see, the habitat is very heavily enroached. This is, as you can see, this value is where you, uh, the valley there is where you can find um, pockets of it and very many remnants. It's a long, you know, um, valley where people, as you can see, have cultivated on the side and cleared most of the bushes. In fact, uh, one of the IPR person, the main guy who's been um, translocating, Peter Fundi, was telling us that these colobus actually seen walking from, hopping from trees, patches to others because they, their habitat is completely decimated, slowly dying and disappearing. And as we know, colobus are hardly, you know, not very well, they don't crop forage at all from people's um, uh, agricultural farms. It's something of a phenomenon when their own wild foods in nature are actually deplenished. Dep dep so they are forced to go to the crops, uh, to the farms and actually uh, basically forage on crops, which has been a big problem. And what we started, what they started doing first was actually they did start look, uh, translocating these groups, and the first one was translocated and to, taken to Soy Samu Conservancy in 1919, and about 14 individuals. But for some reason, that population remained rather stagnant. Did not. Uh, we think it was probably because of inbreeding. It never went beyond 20 individuals. So when IPR and KD Lewis came in back again in 2013, they did a pre-location assessment and decided, well, they will translocate them this time to Karura, somewhere within their home range or, or geographical range, previous geographical range. And at least 22 groups were relocated in 2014, 2016 after a pre-location assessment. And 112 individuals were successfully located Fortunately, nine mortalities within the past, past six months and 86 birth rates to date. So this is pretty much a very good example of a successful translocation that has occurred. And um, the second lot was moved again to Soisambu in 2018, 2021, three groups again, uh, sorry, 11 groups again in three phases, 83 individuals just to supplement the stagnant group that the, the group that was originally there and stagnating. And, um, and so far, you can see this, this is where they hold, uh, you can see below there, I've actually had the climatizing cages, how they hold them literally for three days. And what happens is if they stay longer, you start having stress symptoms and spontaneous abortions and some get sick and even die. So the, 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 the total number of days that are kept there is three is basically three days. And as you can see in the middle picture there, the bottom is the farmers are the ones who are actually literally driving this project. Yeah. Fundi is co coordinating this, Peter Fundi. But there are actually the successful part of this project is mainly because it's, it is farmer driven. The local people are driving these. They're the, the ones who actually come and tell you, oh, we have a group of five of family fives and and 
oh, recently they had two babies or something like that. And then they, you know how many uh, individuals you're moving from that family because part of the success of this project, in fact, a big part of the success of this project is because they have actually been moved according to families. And the farmers are the best people to tell you where they are and how many they are so that you can successfully move them. And that is what has actually contributed to the success of this project. Um, so the next one, the Tana River primates, I won't go over, to take too long over these. And you can see that mainly they, have, they share the same distribution along uh, the Tana River rainforest, strictly limited to the Tana River rainforest, M major human impact. And that has been one of the main reasons that is happening, but also natural impacts. And one of the issues that actually, I think that could cause long-term uh, some problems or potential issues are climate change because of the nature impact as studies have shown that one of the problems why these species have been impacted is because of a lot of die hard and uh, changes of river um, uh, uh, altering, uh, alter, altering river causes. And this can be affected by climate change and just even the way that the river is used upland. So 60% to 60% to 50% of these species are found within the Tunnel River. Uh, so a lot of this is dependent on community um, interventions, which I think um, Stan is going to uh, talk a, a bit about in, in his talks. One of these uh, barbets found in Kenya, and only in Kenya, is Amanda. As I said, not much is known about this. And I think one of the reasons, or at least at least reported by um, Dijon and Putinsky in 2012, was that they don't have, um, they live in very low densities, and there's a problem of fresh water in these islands, this group of islands. And, um, and they're also hunted and also sold as pets. So the seriousness of this aspect is not really well documented or known and something worth studying to follow up on how, 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 how much of these threats are actually affecting this endemic species in Kenya. The corbs, I will not uh, spend so much time on this uh, is actually considered least of least concern, but all the same worth mentioning because it's endemic to Kenya, found mainly in the central areas. And please note how the central islands is somewhere where the Badea Mountains, the, even um, as far as, um, of course, Mount Kenya, Gong Hills, and parts of it in like Kipia. And you can see these areas are actually very high population of people. One of the biggest problems with what's happening in Kenya, of course, is the increase in people, uh, human population, which is intensified, as I'll talk about later in, briefly in the next few slides. Um, the Kikuyu small yet Galago, interesting thing, it's highly adaptable, found in pockets here and there between the highlands again, in the same area where highly, highly populated areas again, suffers a lot of uh, loss in habitat fragmentations. And a lot of the natural habitat has been replaced by plantations and settlements, and largely because of the um, increase in human population I was talking about. And then you have this <laughs> very adorable looking, critically endangered portal, which is basically at least reported to be found there, at least there, um, much of the, uh, of the habitat is degraded again, and possibly this subspecies is going extant or extinct, um, but there's not sufficient data to actually approve, uh, to confirm this. And I think uh, Yvonne is in the panels, uh, is in, can actually clarify some of these things later, just when there are questions, any questions about it. And then there's the tighter, uh, mount, uh, tighter mountain dwarf, Galago. And this Galago has an interesting story, which I'll go into more details, but it was, I did basically because of its very unique vocal repertoire as compared to other Gal Galagos in the areas and very qualitative, distinctive, but has, um, there's a very little known about this population. I think there's a University of Elins Elinsky uh, 
group that's studying them. And the last time it was first reported in 22, and now 20 years later, or maybe 18, maybe 2018, I think, or 2020, they kind of rediscovered it again. I think people thought it had disappeared, but it's still there, but barely there. It's extent as far as they're reporting, as I'll explain later. So according to Dijon and Butinsky, um, 20, uh, 2012, in East Africa, the general with the highest number of threatened species is vulnerable, that are vulnerable, endangered, or critically endangered, IUC in 2011, uh, or the Pearl Colobus and the Pileo, which is now currently the Pileo Colobus and the Sacocibus, which is actually what is happening. As you know, this is where the, both the Tana River Mangabees and the Tana River Colobus are found, are under the genus. So back to a bit of what I wanted to talk about is Kenyan primate primates that are either lost or were found lost or disappearing or rediscovered new populations and extinct or local extinct ones. And I won't dwell so much into the details because I think um, a lot of this will be discussed by Stan in his talk about the crisis, the, extinct, the extinction crisis in Kenya of primates. As we know, back in the mid nineties, the Debrazas were thought to be vanishing from Kenya. The, the, the Debraza is, not at all um, critically endangered globally in the IUCN list. In fact, it's found in other parts of Africa, but in Kenya, it lives a very precarious life in terms of its habitats is disappearing. And then they have the tighter mountain dwarf galigo I mentioned earlier. We particularly think it's extinct now. Very little is known about it been studied, very few populations are found in Taita in one, I think two forest patches. And then again, the Debraza new populations after we thought were disappearing in the mid nineties, uh, a new population was reported in, um, in Murphy Ranges. And this was actually considered that now, I think the most Southern Eastern um, uh, range of a Debraza colobus in Africa globally actually. So that was good hopes after thinking that the, the, the uh, Debraza monkeys were actually going extinct in Kenya. And then we have what we think that pe people came back and started saying that the dwarf Galago, which was feared extinct, was rediscovered, still there. And then we have the Southern Potters, which at least last reported in 2015 in Kenya but still in Tanzania, it is endemic to both Tan to Tanzania and Kenya. So I think the last ones were spotted in, in uh, basically in Kenya in 2015, as far as I think I remember. So back to the Debraza, and I want to bring the Debraza here as quickly and very briefly is to explain how Debraza is, a, is, a, is symbolic of a lot of what is happening. Uh, the good news is we there's this re population that is found in Matthew Ranges, which offers a very good opportunity for IPR to have been studying. And since 2016, we started studying um, the, the Western population side, which is literally at the museum grounds in, in Kitale. And uh, of course, in an isolated part, but you can find every, in different places in Mount Elgon, Saiwa Dam, Kakamega, still very precariously living there. And then very much a threat still threatened, um, habitat is still losing. As you can see, the picture there I have is showing the river and forest in the Transoya River and where you see it's right next to the farms. And most of these riv uh, river and forests is uh, forest in the Transoya and on most parts of the river have been replaced by exotic species. People will clear farms and replace them with exotic species like eucalyptus. And one thing that I'd like to highlight is the intensity of the human wildlife conflict as human uh, populations increase and primate population decrease, it intensifies. And people have come to point of, short, of taking drastic measures where you see they're trapping um, these people. A, a lot of young men leave, drop out from school to guard crops. And this is something that Fundi, who was actually doing a preliminary study assessment to see whether they can be translocated elsewhere, found that 
a lot of men have actually dropped out. There's some social implications to this too, as well as economic. And people are taking drastic measures, building guiding places where they can actually hide in, and, and be able to, to chase them away from crop uh, foraging. So this is a, just an indication of what is reflected elsewhere in Kenya. This is just symbolic of a lot of species that are uh, rather in poor states and statuses because of, of human enrichment. So the good news is we thought that the, the, uh, the Mount Kilimanjaro Gerezo um, or Colobus was no longer in Kenya, but until it was actually, I think it was 2018 reported by um, Butinsky and Dijon. And very few found in this forest is that Gitobo and the Tok Tok, very few. And um, at least it reportedly um, qualifies for being critically endangered uh, or endangered species actually in, in globally. But in Kenya, it's I think the most endangered sub, um, sub, uh, subspecies uh, of any of the primates. And then we have the Potus monkey, which as I mentioned last seen in 2015, but critically endangered as well in Tanzania where it's still thriving. But one thing I'd like to really focus is to show how it's isolated from the other groups and its chances are very low, despite the fact that these population are remnant in a transboundary protected area, which is uh, Masai Mara on the Kenyan side and the Serengeti National Park. And just goes to show how protected areas are no longer enough, yeah, to actually conserve our primates. And we need to go towards the community to look for help in how to extend in interventions. So this is the last slide, and it's basically showing about where these endemic species are mostly, con mostly concentrated in. And you can see central Kenya where it's mostly inhabited and very, uh, very, um, you know, by, by humans and a lot of competition directly with humans here. So um, something to continue to talk about, to think about in terms of when you're talking about interventions and translocation, how communities are part of the, of the solution not the problem in terms of helping us, because this is competition for both uh, you know, primates, non-human primates and humans. And I think that's the last map. And um, I just wanted to talk briefly is to say that uh, Stan will be talking more about the extension crisis in Kenya. And then uh, Dr. Mohammed from the Kenya Wildlife um, uh, Institute will be talking about the interventions required to halt primate extinctions. So without further ado, I think I've gone over by about a few minutes, by three minutes. So I'll pass on to the next person and thank you for your time. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nancy, for that uh, insightful presentation. Thank you. So ladies and gentlemen, we will uh, shift gears and uh, we go straight to the panelist uh, presentation, which is uh, session two. And for the interest of time, I will not go through the detailed uh, bios of uh, our panelists, but uh, just go straight to their presentation. And uh, to open us, uh, to open the chapter of our panelists, uh, presentation is Dr. Kimberly Hawkins from the Center for Ecology and Conservation at the University of Exeter, who will be taking us through people, culture, and private conservation. Welcome, Dr. Kim. Yeah, thank you um, so much for this invite. Um, can you see my screen okay? Yes, we can see. Wonderful. Um, so yes, I've been asked to provide a very brief introduction to why human dimensions are so important for primate conservation, and Nancy just touched upon a couple of those. Um, I may mean to keep the presentation very general, but um, the points that I'll make will certainly be relevant to primate conservation in Kenya, as they are in many other parts um, of uh, Africa. And um, I should be honest that most of my research has been done on human great ape coexistence, mostly in West Africa. But I was lucky enough to teach on field schools in uh, Kenya with Nancy, Peter Fundy and Stan. And it's great to have this opportunity to see everyone again and discuss these um, uh, very important issues that we spent a lot of time discussing um, during these field courses. 
So just to broaden out, um, I think many of you will agree that humans are a dominant force shaping our planet and human impacts from deforestation, infrastructural development, agriculture and hunting showing no signs of abating. And many scientists now believe we are in a new geological epoch, the Anthropocene. And with continued human population growth and the associated expansion of human dominated areas, it has been estimated that more than 75% of land surfaces have been anthropogenically mollified in, in one way or another and can no longer be called wild or wilderness areas. And it's actually been projected that the world's population will continue to grow and it will reach nearly 10 billion by 2050. So we're really now standing at a tipping point of global species extinctions with human actions primarily responsible for taking us to the brink, uh, uh, the brink of a sixth mass extinction. And non-human primates because of their slow life histories and small population sizes are particularly at risk. So again, Stan will be talking about this in a lot more detail, but recent estimates indicate that approximately 60% of primate species are threatened with extinction. And the primary cause um, is unsustainable human practices. So most remaining populations of primates live in environments that have been influenced in some way or another by humans. So even in protected areas, um, primates can live in forests that are bisected by major roads. Um, Many primates live on forest farm edges and some even can survive in urban areas. And whether we like to admit it or not, most primate populations are being managed to some degree by human intervention. And so while primates are really living in this very complicated, complex web of political, social and cultural human forces. And so for conservation, these must be considered um, in addition to our understanding of primates evolutionary and ecological characteristics and needs. <clears throat> and conservation research has traditionally been very biologically focused, but there's certainly growing acknowledgement that conservation is also about people. And we're seeing um, growth in the application of research areas such as conservation psychology, conservation economics, including human behavior and also politics in, uh, in our conservation solutions. Um, and research on human dimensions of primate conservation often focuses on how people's knowledge, values and behaviors influence and are affected by decisions about the conservation of primates and the management of the resources that they need. So I think um, something that we should all be considering when thinking about primate conservation is that living alongside primates can provide some benefits to people. And we're all familiar with um, some primate populations providing economic benefits to local people through tourism and through employment. Um, but also human cultures worldwide can have quite deep rooted primordial connections to non-human primates. And so primates can have cultural or religious significance for people that, um, that they live nearby. And it's important to remember that uh, local people can be powerful advocates for conservation, like the um, example that Nancy just gave us. But it's also important to note that cultural arguments for conservation might not always work as people's beliefs and cultures are certainly not fixed. And so they're very, very fluid. So a recent paper that I contributed um, showed that a substantial proportion of the world's primates inhabit lands managed by indigenous peoples. And these indigenous perspectives, knowledge um, systems and histories hold globally important conservation lessons for primates. And in Africa, both protected areas and land managed by indigenous peoples and other local communities are especially important for primate conservation. So, very briefly, I want to say a few more specific words on why understanding human dimensions can help a specific conservation threat. And that threat is um, human wildlife conflict. And um, that's something that a lot of my work has focused on. So I talked about some of the benefits, but we also know that living alongside primates can impose costs upon local people that are frequently cited as the drivers of conflict. Um, and primate damage, as Nancy mentioned, can include crop feeding. Um, it can also include depredation upon livestock. And for example, baboons can occasionally feed on um, young goats. They can also have aggressive interactions between primates and people. Primates can cause damage to property, in some cases, um, disease transmission to people. And hopefully we'll be hearing a little bit more about that later. 
but also conflict can be a major cause of wildlife mortality um, because farmers might engage in preemptive or retaliatory killings of problematic wildlife to protect their crops or livestock. And this can actually impact an individual's, a community's and a society's desire to support conservation programs. However, I want to um, say something that I think is really important and the need, we, we have a very strong need to be careful when we use the term conflict as um, it might impact the way that people view their interactions with primates. For example, local communities might not view a relationship that they have with primates as conflict and instead exhibit a very high level of tolerance where primate damage is just seen as a normal part of coexisting with wildlife and it can be very problematic if researchers and conservation practitioners then move into that environment and start using the word conflict um, to describe these interactions. Also whilst primate damage might drive conflict it's becoming increasingly acknowledged that different goals, perceptions and levels of empowerment between humans, so people including researchers, policy makers, local communities and other stakeholder groups might underlie conservation conflicts. So, for example, very often the conflict arises not specifically because of what the animal is doing, but because there's a conflict of interest between two or more different groups of people. So again, conservation becomes about people. And another important point is that the level of primate damage might not relate to the level of conflict produced. And reducing wildlife damage alone will often fail to produce long-term conflict resolution. So to fully understand what is going on requires understanding the more complicated human dimension. It doesn't mean that people shouldn't be encouraged to change what they do sometimes if it um, compromises the conservation of a particular primate species, for example, um, trying to encourage people to stop retaliatory killing. But as conservationists, before trying to change human attitudes, we should really be trying to understand um, what these human attitudes are, whilst being sensitive to people's views and changes should really be developed in association with people as part of a kind of negotiation pro uh, process. So just to finish this very short presentation, um, I just wanted to throw in a statement that you may or may not agree with. Um, but in a world with growing numbers of people who require land and resources, um, my opinion is that conservation in shared landscapes, whether these are protected or not, can only work if they take into account the costs and constraints imposed on those people sharing space and resources with primates, um, whilst acknowledging the role of conflicts of interest between gift different groups of people involved in conservation. And of course, um, this does require understanding human dimensions of conservation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kim, for that uh, insightful presentation. I will encourage uh, participants that uh, you can share your questions through the chat box and we'll be able to go through them after all the presentations. So our next panelist is uh, Dr. Masi Akini. He is a disease ecologist at the Institute of Primate Research to take us through primates, climate change and diseases in the context of one health approach. Welcome, Dr. Masi. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Great. Uh, Dr. Kim, ah, uh, wait. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> no, it's okay. <laughs> uh, I need to share my slides. So, um, just a minute. Sorry about that. I need to change and swap the slides. Sorry about that, just a minute. I need to swap my screens. Okay. okay, can you see the screen now? Yes, yes. you can see. Great. So today I'll be talking about primates, um, climate change and disease in the context of uh, One Health. I have a background as a veterinarian, but I also have a PhD in biology with a keen focus on disease ecology. So just to start with the idea of uh, One Health, 
And One Health really is summarized as uh, the idea that the health of people uh, and that of animals and the environment are really um, interconnected. So when we protect one segment of these different aspects, then we protect or we help protect all. And this particular um, slide is very important because with the background that we've been given, both by uh, Drs. Moenda and Kim, is that there's a lot that is going on where humans are involved. And so the multiple factors that um, will influence the health of an ecosystem. And a lot of these factors, a lot of them are driven by humans. So uh, the anthropogenic pressure that we've talked about in terms of the human population is increasing. And so this means that humans are actually encroaching into habitats that um, are actually for wildlife. And so there's that issue about a restraint of the resources that are available um, for wildlife and primates uh, specifically. There are multiple human behaviors that will lead to uh, climate change. And we do know that climate change has an impact on different segments of the ecosystem, um, even in, including uh, the amount of water or rainfall that we receive. And the changes in the ecosystem or habitats will influence things like vectors. And normally what vectors will do is they will then be able to invade um, different uh, bits of the environment and then in, end up infecting wildlife or even new pathogens will arise and so climate change, there's a lot where climate change is concerned, but given the time that we have today, I don't think we'll get into details about uh, the climate change. Uh, deforestation and bushmeat has been mentioned. We do know that primates have been used um, by many people as a meal. And so this then leads to declining populations of, uh, of primates as well. Uh, the, I think we had a study published in 2016 that showed that people do eat some of these primates even in Kenya. There are also aspects of illegal animal trade and um, the intensive animal farms, really all of this end up impacting in, in the ecosystem. And we do know changes in the ecosystem will then lead to loss of biodiversity amongst other things. And this really leads to increase of emerging pathogens. We are aware that most of emerging pathogens come from wildlife, so they have a zoonotic uh, origin. And zoonosis really means you're transferring infections from uh, animals to humans, and that's what we normally call like a spillover. So that these pathogens are moving from the wildlife all the way to domestic animals and our pets and the humans. But there's also this other side that we never talk about much. That's really the reverse spillover, meaning that also pathogens that are harbored by domestic animals and humans can also spill back the wildlife. And this is where our primates um, are. And uh, this for sure has been seen with the ongoing pandemic of COVID-19. There were several cases of um, some of the apes that were positive for uh, coronavirus. And uh, that was, I think, uh, last last year. And also way before that, there was a different coronavirus, a human one, the OC43. Also um, an outbreak was reported in um, wild chimpanzees showing that really there are cases of reverse um, zoonosis. So we need to be paying attention. Uh, and uh, at the Primate Research Center, we actually were funded for a study that looked uh, that screened for COVID-19 um, and uh, a few primate populations, but we didn't see we didn't see much. So that's a good thing. And so, apart from coronaviruses, there's a whole uh, list of different um, pathogens that can be transmitted from humans to the primates. And this is because of the increased contact that we have talked about. Um, in, in terms of sharing of resources and just being in the same uh, habitat and conflict as well. And uh, 
we do know that some of these pathogens have been um, associated with declines in population for some of the primates. And this slide just shows a few uh, about chimpanzees here and gibbons being killed by influenza virus, gorilla by measles virus, marmosets by harpies, golden uh, tamarinds by um, yellow fever, baboons uh, by tuberculosis. But there's a whole list. There are even enteric uh, parasites that are shared between uh, primates and non-human primates and, and humans. So in a nutshell, we uh, as a primate conservationists and disease ecologists, we need to come together and um, come up with one health interdisciplinary surveillance uh, preparedness and responses. And so having, um, having different programs that monitor animal health, looking at farming practices that are there, looking at kind of the antimicrobial uh, use and prescriptions, and uh, just research in emerging diseases, equally looking at the human health. How do you manage uh, the urbanization? And um, how do you reduce human primate conflict amongst other things and uh, continued uh, surveillance? So it's more of a proactive uh, surveillance and being able to predict whether uh, diseases will emerge or re-emerge. And also looking at the environment health. What does it take to reduce forestation? Um, and what does it take to limit environmental uh, pollution, improving waste management, and also just looking at what factors are influencing climate change and how do we mitigate all of these threats? Because these threats affect humans, they affect animals, they affect wildlife, and they affect the environment. And so we cannot have a silo where we look at one part of the ecosystem health and forget the other part. And so what we are looking at now with most of the One Health uh, surveillance approaches is integrating all of this um, different silos together to come up with uh, ways to improve uh, the ecosystem. So I will leave it at that, but that's the nutshell um, of what we do with our One Health programs at IPR. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Masi. Our next uh, panelist is uh, Pamela, who is the director of the Colopas Conservation in Biani, who will be taking us through conserving Africa's forgotten primates in suburban Kenya. Welcome, Pam, and uh, let's keep it brief. Thank you. Yeah, that's fine. My name is Pam, Pam Cunningworth. I've worked with Colobus Conservation since 2003. And we work on reducing the human primate conflict in a suburban area. And today I want to show you what we do in Diani, Kenya. So Diani is located on the southeastern corner of, of Kenya. And this is a photograph of Diani. You can see that there's still trees and forest patches left in amongst the hotels, homes, and businesses. And what's remarkable about Diani, globally remarkable, is that we have six primates that live, live in the town. So Colobus, of course, is our flagship species. It's vulnerable to extinction. We recently did the genetics on the Colobus and found that there's probably only about 35,000 left, of which there's about 4,000 left in Kenya. They were extirpated uh, from north of Mombasa by 1979, and that was due to hunting and Agri uh, forest conversion to agricultural land. We also have the Sykes monkey, the vervet monkey, and the yellow baboon. Diani is only seven square kilometers, and we have about 1,500 monkeys living in those seven square kilometers. So uh, there's monkeys everywhere. It's really quite extraordinary. And we also have two types of galago. 
the dwarf and the greater Galago, and these are our nocturnal primates. Colobus conservation, what we do is we put together animal welfare efforts and conservation efforts to achieve our mission statement, which is to conserve and pres preserve the primates and forests of southeastern Kenya. So, of course, we all know habitat loss is our biggest issue globally in Diani, in Kwale. Um, primates require forests, require trees. Uh, for colobus and sites, monkeys and the galagos, they're forest dependent. And for vervets and baboons, they also use forest and use trees, even though they're more ground dwelling. So we work with the communities to get trees planted in the ground and get them, once they're in the ground, get them growing. And this isn't just any trees, and we have to be very specific about the trees that are getting planted. Diani is part of the coastal forest of Eastern Africa, global biodiversity hotspot. So a global biodiversity hotspot are areas where you have high plant and animal species richness, but importantly, that there's a lot of uniqueness to these species so that they're, they're locally restricted. So the areas are small, so their threat is really severe. So what we're trying to do is get those indigenous trees from, from the Diani forest, from the original Diani forest planted and growing. So this is an, the same picture of Diani, but this time I want you to notice that there's a road. This road was put in in 1971, straight through uh, primary forest, that global biodiversity hotspot. And what happens is now that the monkeys have to cross the road to access, access the resources, water, foraging, dispersal, finding sleeping sites, and 35% of our community calls to colobus conservation are about animals, uh, primates that are hit on the road. So in 1996, we developed the first color bridge. This is a aerial canopy bridge over the road. And now we have 32 on this nine kilometer stretch of road. So during our surveys, we extrapolated the numbers and we we have a good estimate that there's about a quarter of a million crossings on the canopy bridges in every, every single year. So this is reducing the, the road barrier effect. So allowing animals to cross the road that they wouldn't normally cross because of the high traffic volumes. And this also reduces those, the number of primates that are getting hit on the road. 17% of our call-outs are electrocutions. Looking at our animal welfare data for about 20 years worth of data, it shows that colobus adults are at the highest risk of electrocution. And of the colobus adults, it's the adult males. And we extrapolate that out and it seems to, it seems that Primates that are eight kilos and greater are likely more at risk from electrocutions. So we work with Kenya Power to trim trees around power lines so that the monkeys can't jump from the vegetation onto the lines. And we work also with Kenya Power to insulate those lines. So in 2016, Kenya Power gave us 12 kilometers of insulated cable and we did the installation in our hotspots, our electrocution hotspots, and they moved some of the transformers where we were having electrocutions, multiple electrocutions. Another aspect to the human primate conflict is poaching and poaching uh, comes in different forms in Diani. Uh, primate pets is one of them. And we, in Diani 20 years ago, we had quite a few primate pets. And through our work with um, confiscating them with KWS, uh, community awareness, we 
have reduced that the number of primate pets and and now there's very few in our area from about 2005 onward. There's also snaring and typically the primates are not getting snared, they're not the target, but there's other, um, the smaller antelope or different animals that are getting targeted. But of course, primates are on the ground because a lot of the forest and the trees are missing and they get caught up in the snares. So we also work with KWS to do the desnaring and remove snares from the forest areas. So there's other types of poaching which we run across uh, where dogs attack um, primates as well. And unfortunately, colobus are the number one uh, victim from dog attacks. And one of the other things that is maybe uh, less seen around is in Diani, we have a lot of people that are hand feeding monkeys. Now there is uh, quite a lot of implications to this. What Mercy just talked about is disease transmission. We were really concerned at Colobus Conservation because of coronavirus. If people are hand feeding them, what are the chances of uh, COVID getting into our primate populations? That is a big concern. Hand feeding them also increases aggression from monkeys to people. So maybe they will accept um, peanuts from you, but they will look at the next person and wonder why they're not giving them peanuts and it increases the, the overall aggression. Eating uh, human foods also affects health, especially of colobus. Colobus are leaf eaters. So when they're given foods that are not leaves, we are seeing health issues amongst those individuals. It also reduces uh, the primates from just eating their natural wild foods and it, it brings them much closer to people. So, so hand feeding primates is a real issue in suburban areas. And then there's a different kind of issue, which is the monkeys going to homes, businesses, and hotels and causing some management issues. And some people take things into their, take, take matters into their own hands by uh, putting paint, dumping paint on individuals or killing them. It's, and other people don't prevent the animals from entering. So all of these are um, issues that obviously they don't stop the problem and they have animal welfare concerns. So Colobus Conservation is working with hotels in Diani and to provide humane ways of dealing with these issues. And we know that almost all these issues are because of the, of the primate access to human foods. So if we can reduce their, their access to food, then you can reduce that, that conflict in, within the um, homes, hotels, and businesses. So Colobus Conservation, we do, we have a 24 seven emergency response. So we're, we give ourselves 20 minutes to leave once we uh, get a report of, a, of an issue. So we do our rescuing and we rehabilitate the animals and then we release them back to the wild and develop um, good survivorship release protocols, one for each species because each species uh, reacts differently to releases. And we try to get our message out through awareness campaigns, bringing in school groups, meeting, having workshops with different community groups. Um, and just, we have a new visitor center. So if anybody is in the area, please drop in. So thank you very much. It, five minutes is very short. I hope I've covered most of the, the items. Uh, let me know if there's anything else I can answer for you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Pam, for that uh, presentation. Indeed, that's an excellent work that Colobus Conservation in Diani are doing. Uh, our next uh, panelist is uh, Dr. Stanislaus Kivai, who is a senior research scientist and primatologist and head of private conservation and ecology program at the Institute of uh, Primate Research. Welcome, uh, Dr. Stan.
Thank you, Richard. Um, I, I hope everyone can see my, my, my presentation. Yes, we can see. Maybe just uh, you can move to the far left of the new uh, slideshow. Go to slideshow. Slideshow. Just a minute. Yeah, just up there. Yes, and yes. there. From start. From start, yes. Thank you. Is that okay? Yeah, that's fine. Okay, thank you so much and welcome everybody to my presentation. And I will actually try to focus on the climate extinction crisis in, uh, and, and, and then try to end my talk with some insights uh, uh, to Kenyan primates. So uh, maybe as a way of starting, most of what are projected there in uh, the front screen is uh, some of the primates we have uh, in Kenya. So uh, why do primates matter to us? I think most of the presenters who have done this before, they've gone through this, like they support lively, livelihoods. Here in Kenya, we have a lot of uh, income generation from uh, primate works. They uh, actually have a lot of attachment to cultural and religious attachments to the local people. And they also provide a lot of insight to human evolution, biology, and behavior as one of the most studied animal taxa. And the other thing, they are very key in understanding the emerging human diseases and how they are transmitted in, uh, across uh, different uh, organisms and also in the ecosystem. And they are very crucial in the ecosystem function and the structure as they constitute an important part of the biodiversity component. And they also act as very, very, as very good pollinators and seed dispersers that's enhancing things like forage, forest uh, re regeneration. Another thing we should note, uh, pr uh, primates also act as prey species and as at the same time as predator uh, species, which is very good when it comes to ecological balancing. So that is why it's very important and we cannot actually uh, overlook the conservation of primates. Looking at the primates and the risks uh, of extinction, which they face, I will just go over um, uh, what, what, what primatologists have actually found out. And out of the 504 extant primate species, 65% of them are actually faced with extinctions or, uh, or, or they are actually categorized as endangered. The most unfortunate thing is 93% of these primate species are actually showing a sharp decline in their populations. And the most gloomy thing is, if you look at the global patterns of primates, uh, four countries, which are Brazil, Madagascar, Indonesia, and Democratic Republic of Congo, holds about 65% of the world's uh, uh, diversity of the, the, the primates. So if, if, if we temper up with these two countries or the habitats which are critical for primates, then uh, we are staring at a, a very gloomy future for primates. The other thing you should note is, we know in Africa and many other places, protected, protected areas provide, uh, provide an avenue for conservation. But unfortunately, only 14 to 38% of our primate populations globally occur in protected areas. 94% of these primate populations um, uh, 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 occur only in those uh, uh, um, protected area, which is a very small percentage, given that most of our conservation approaches are actually directed to protected areas, whether they are community conservation areas or they are nationally protected areas. And narrowing to Kenya, Kenya holds actually about 17 to 24% of the African primate biodiversity. That is, um, out of the 111 uh, primate species occurring in Africa, about 19, between 19 to, 20, uh, to 27 are actually found in Kenya. Um, um, the other thing is 50% um, of the primate di diversity we have here in Kenya or the primate species which the country holds are actually considered threatened. Looking at the current primate regions cons uh, and conservation status and population trends, I've actually decided to project this map, which, has, uh, which I extracted from work by Estrada 2019, uh, 20, uh, 20, 2017 and uh, Estrada and Gaba 2022. And you can see from that map, 
uh, the distribution of primates and uh, the number of the species which are threatened and the number which uh, where the populations are declining. And you can clearly very uh, you can clearly see that Madagascar, Asia are really having a serious problem when it comes to popula uh, population decline as well as the number of pr primates that are threatened. But on the extreme left, you can see the global pattern. 75% of the, the population of the primates are declining and 55% of that is actually, uh, uh, is actually uh, threatened. So the, the previous presenters have actually highlighted on some of the key drivers of the primates towards extinction. And I want to highlight here that habitat degradation, fragmentation and loss is actually the, primate con uh, the primary driver of primate extinction. The level at which we are actually losing uh, the, the forest habitats, which are core for primary conservation, uh, are core for primate conservation, is really alarming. This is actually largely driven by expansion in the industrial agriculture, because the, like, like Kim uh, mentioned, the wild population is actually growing so fast, and we are actually going to reach uh, a population of about uh, uh, 10, uh, 10 billion in the next uh, century. So with that kind of uh, population increase, food security is becoming an issue. And for us to provide the food for the growing population, forests are, are being actually uh, cut down. The other problem is unsustainable bushmeat hunting. This is a problem like when it comes to Africa, especially in West Africa. But it's not just a problem in West Africa. It's also a problem here in Kenya. I think some of the presenters have highlighted on how uh, some areas, these animals are, are, game, are being killed for, for meat. The other thing is illegal pet trade. I think um, Palm has clearly shown that uh, with what is happening at the cost. Uh, we have also trade on uh, some of these body parts, which is also a very common uh, practice in some of our local communities. And also infrastructural uh, expansion in terms of road de development, railways, this is not only taking habitat from, away from primates, but also it's contributing to the mortality of these primates. The other thing is mining, damming, oil, gas, and, uh, and, and gas exploration. Climate change, I think Masi has alluded on that. It's a major problem where we see uh, 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 changes in habitat. Habitats become so un, uh, becoming so unfavorable to, to primates. And emerging diseases is another key driver. So, how does the primate future look like in, uh, in view of all these drivers? I want to draw attention to the fact that the human population is growing. Agricultural expansion is also uh, uh, increasing at an alarming rate. And this is also complicated by climate change. And with all these problems, we are likely to encounter uh, or to have very uh, very, it's going to affect the suitable habitat for primates and also the primate populations uh, or the, the, the recovery of the primate population is going to be constrained. And with time, if conservation interventions are not adequate, then we are going to stare at mass extinction of primates. Uh, focusing now into Kenya, uh, uh, the primate hotspots here in Kenya are found in different places. And uh, to mention a few, we have the Lower Tana River, where we have some of the top global endangered primates. We have the Kakameka Forest, which has the highest bio, uh, biomass of primates. The coastal forest, as you've heard uh, Pam saying, the Matthews Ranch, where we have two of the Kenya's uh, threatened species as well, the Mau Forest and the Mount Kenya Forest. The most unfortunate thing with these uh, primate hotspots is we are uh, witnessing uh, um, exponential human population growth in these places. The same areas are also characterized with very high uh, uh, poverty index level. And the other thing, if we look at the forests in these areas, like the Mao, the, uh, the Kakamega, the coastal forests, I think that was very evident in the previous uh, presentation that we are losing these forests at an alarming rate. The other thing is human, con I, I cannot talk more, I cannot emphasize more on human wildlife uh, human and human primate conflict. It's another major thing whereby we are seeing a lot of elimination of these primates as crop pests. And again, 
uh, among the Kenyan population, uh, primates awareness seems to be a lot. Not many people know about uh, primates. And even in, when it comes to the generation of scientific data, which is very key in informing uh, conservation, we have a lot of species that are data deficient. As Nancy has alerted, and most of these species here uh, include those uh, lesser primates. And I, like I've also shown in the larger global picture, infrastructural development is a major issue. With you, if you think of the Lapset and other major projects, they are actually gonna affect the uh, primate uh, conservation and habitat. So with these uh, pressures facing uh, different primates, we are actually going to stare to an inevitable primate uh, ex uh, extinctions at the national level. And with all those pressures, we have already started seeing some of the primates actually uh, giving indications of a possible disappearance in the near future, if at all we don't take uh, concerted efforts. And I will start by mentioning that um, there is a recent publication which has shown that the southern patas monkey, which used to occur in Amboseli and the Chulu areas in Kenya, perhaps is now nationally extinct and we may have some few populations now in, 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 in Tanzania and we don't have it in, uh, anymore in Kenya. It's counterfeit, the Eastern uh, Patas monkey, which occurs in like Kipia and the Northern parts of Kenya, the numbers also have declined so much and the range where we used to know it occurs has shrunk so much. So uh, even the fate of it uh, still remains very unclear. Uh, I can't talk, uh, I can't emphasize more about the Tana River Red Colobus and the Tana River Mankabe. The lower Tana River, uh, uh, River Rhine ecosystem has been subjected to a lot of infrastructural development and also agricultural uh, development. This has robbed the, these two primates, a um, huge chunk of their habitat, and they are actually staring the same problem of, uh, of, 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 of um, extirpation in some areas or extinction in the near future. Uh, on the lower side at the window, we have the Kilimanjaro Guresa or the uh, Colobus caudata. And this is one of the Kenya's most endangered primates with less than 200 individuals remaining. We have the, the species occurring in a uh, few pockets in, uh, uh, in, uh, in Boundary Forest in Oloitoktok and Kitobo Forest. If you go to those forests, Oloitoktok Forest is actually now being converted to a kind of exotic forest. The Gitobo forest is under immense human pressure, and we are likely to uh, uh, we are likely to lose these uh, primate species. On the bottom right, uh, we have the mountain porter. It's another uh, threatened primate, which which is char characterized as a, a critically threatened at the national level. And also, we don't have much of uh, much information about it. So um, I've just mentioned this because these are the primates which I think. Uh, in the Kenyan perspective, the five of them are among the primate species that are facing, facing the greatest uh, threat of extinctions. And the conservation bodies and the conservation stakeholders, they need to develop uh, urgent initiatives to have some interventions to protect these pro uh, primates from going uh, to extinction. So as Primatologists, as conservation stakeholders interested in biodiversity conservation, we have to pull together and actually uh, stand tall in terms of protecting these primates and their species. Otherwise, we are going to lose them uh, in the near future. And with that presentation, I would like to hush up my colleague, Dr. Mohammed, to look at the interventions that are being put in place or which we need to put in place actually to avert this uh, situation of uh, 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 this bad situation of primate extinctions. So thank you so much. And uh, I will pave way to Dr. Mohammed to complete this uh, 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 talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kibai. That was very insightful. And you are really surrounded by nature. I can hear lots of birds calls uh, you know, cheering you from the background. So uh, we welcome our last uh, panelist, Dr. Omar Mohammed, who is the principal scientist, Marine and Coastal Research Center at the Wildlife Research and Training Institute to take us through intervention required to hold primate extinction crisis. Uh, Dr. Omar, uh, welcome.
Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, okay, um, uh, so good evening, everyone. Uh, this is the last presentation, um, and it's the way it is. I'm supposed to sum it up all. Uh, at, um, as you, uh, all the other speakers have mentioned, uh, some of the hotspots for primates include the, the coastal forest, and that's where I want to focus my talk on. And uh, as you've seen some of the presentation, uh, especially on uh, Diani, uh, where we have the, uh, the colobus, um, the Angola colobus. And uh, uh, what I'm going also to focus on my talk is the unique, uh, the primate reserve in the, in the Tana, the lower Tana reserve. Basically, uh, that area has two of the two charismatic uh, primate species that are endemic to that area and also which are endangered. That is uh, the, the colobus, uh, uh, the red colobus that stands at a population of uh, 1,219 currently. And also, uh, it is home to the Mangabi, the crested Mangabi, whose population currently stands at 1,650. The area also is home to six other species of uh, primates uh, that um, I've not highlighted their population and possibly uh, there's uh, very little information that is known about this particular species. And our assessment of that area, uh, actually as representative as it is for the coast, as you've seen for Diani, where we have uh, the habitat is uh, surely and slowly disappearing as the whole of Diani is urbanizing. And uh, you know the nature of the colobas that are found in, in, the, in the area. They may not survive without, with, without the natural habitat. So the main threats also we found uh, in the Tana area is the habitat loss. Uh, there's also unfortunately inadequate research uh, programs or activities going on. So many things that are happening are not actually actually documented and, and there's no information also to guide uh, the management appropriately on what intervention is to be done. And there's also inadequate community conservation awareness. Um, as it is uh, clearly uh, known that uh, the community in the, especially in the lower Tana, they resisted the establishment of the Tana Primate Reserve. And this one was, um, also witnessed by the community actually going to court and the court actually uh, declaring that the land belongs to the community. So there's that conflict. And what we've also come to realize along the coast, the issue of bushmeat also targeting primates is a reality. And uh, maybe you can see, you can now you can understand why in Kilifi County, we've already lost uh, uh, the colobas that were provided in the area by as uh, reason as 1979. And the, the, the existing population of uh, primates that is found in this area is currently under serious threat, as most of the forests are disappearing. Um, if you go to the Kacha woodland, it is being cleared uh, at a very fast rate. And what you have is a small pockets of uh, forests that are remaining in the area. And when we were in the Tana primate, these are the activities that we found going on, a lot of logging, a lot of beer. people are using the, the logs for beehive. Uh, beekeeping, uh, uh, palm wine tapping, and there's a lot of livestock activity and so many uh, activities, human activities that are actually degrading the habitats and uh, fragmenting it. And also there's the preval uh, emergence of invasive species uh, taking over some of these habitats. As we are all aware, the manga bees and the, colo and the, and the colobas basically don't uh, feed, they have specific uh, a preference for food among the indigenous uh, tree species. So if these species were to disappear, then definitely even these species will cease to exist. Just to show you a map, we have the, the, the primate reserve. This is the lower Tana. The area that highlighted in, uh, in yellow is what you see as uh, the area that is being regarded as the Tana primate reserve. And this uh, town of primate reserve is established as one of the conservation measures to ensure that the habitat of the animals is kept intact and the survival of the animals is ensured. But from our assessments of the area, as recent as last year, you can see how far the habitat of the primate species spread beyond actually uh, the, the, the designated protected area. 
So the animals does not just depend on this small area that is being protected, but they remain, they depend on a, large, a much larger area. And if you look at the map, they would interaction, uh, these animals have interaction with human beings in different human settlements that are also expanding at a very high rate at the moment. And the habitat around this area is also fragmenting. Uh, you see specific species for the Sykes monkeys and the, the, the colobus. You see the distribution is far beyond uh, what you have at the reserve. So what this one tells us is that even with our measures of establishing protected areas as conservation measures, uh, this may not be sufficient uh, in the long run to ensure that the survival of uh, the species is guaranteed. So there's a need to start uh, reevaluating re how we establish our protected areas uh, by considering the habitats that these uh, species actually utilize. So we look at how, how suitable our protected areas. We need to do these assessments and um, see whether the, 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 the protected areas meet the criteria for conservation of biodiversity and in particular these species. So we may need to do, to identify what are the environmental uh, drivers that are actually uh, impacting on the species directly and indirectly. And then we may need to have come up with predictive models to see the areas that uh, and how uh, that the species actually utilize at any particular stage of the life, uh, life or life cycle. And then you, we need to identify the areas that this animal usually use recurrently, they use occasionally, and areas that they don't actually uh, venture into. And from that, we need to compare the probabilities um, and also identify what is the right area to, to declare as a protected area. So basically what we have now in Kenya are small islands where these animals are confined. And if that area was to be decimated, then even the species, they don't have anywhere else to, to run to or to go to. This is quite evident. Uh, if we look at uh, Diani, uh, the population of colobus that exists in Diani right now, we can say it can be classified as highly endangered because uh, the habitat there is disappearing. There's a lot of human activity and we may need to look for maybe an alternative habitat for these animals because now it's beyond control. So there's a lot of actions that need to be taken. And this is not only true for, for Diani, even if you go to Shimoni, if you look at the colobus population that is found in Shimoni, currently there's a port being built, the road has been come up. There's a lot of plants that are coming up in, the, in uh, Shimoni also, and the area is opening up. A lot of people are establishing farms, indigenous trees are being cut down, roads are being built. So you can imagine with all that happening, uh, very soon you will not also have the species, the, 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 the colobus existing in the... Uh, in, in Shimoni. So we are looking at the same scenario, uh, like what has happened in Kilifi, again, replicating itself in Diani, uh, in uh, Shimoni, and, and particularly of interest will be the, 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 the scenario that will unfold in uh, the Tana primate uh, area, the lower Tana, and also spreading as far as the Lamu area. And what is so interesting about the Lamu forest is that we don't have that much accurate information of what exists in the Boni and Dodori forest complex. And these are part of the coastal forests that have immense biodiversity that has not been tapped to. But already, as we are talking, people are already carving up settlement schemes in those areas, uh, planning road networks, and, and the place will have a lot of resort cities. So you can imagine how the habitat will be fragmented and all this is being done without basically highlighting the, the, the unique species we have in that area. The Lapset Corridor has talked about, uh, much about the marine environment, but when it comes to the terrestrial habitat, the wildlife habitats, they have not been given prominence. And uh, this is something that needs to be addressed urgently. We are going to lose a lot of biodiversity uh, before we even realize it. So basically, what we, we, we know is that um, 
there are positive benefits to the pre-existing uh, protected area systems. Uh, as important a percentage of the area that species utilize are actually found within the protected areas. But again, as most of us have uh, presented today, uh, these protected areas are certainly inefficient or insufficient to, to satisfy the spatial requirements for primate species conservation. So we need to have quantify uh, to quantify the effects uh, of what these uh, protected areas mean or they they do. So and also come up with more efficient management tools to try and promote the conservation of biodiversity. As we are talking right now, uh, a lot of uh, these habitats have already been lost. A lot of species possibly have become extinct without even our knowledge. So it is about time we, we start defining um, when it comes to protected area, what are our options? Uh, right now we have a park, we have uh, conservancies, but how can, what other options do we have to promote conservation of our biodiversity? What other ideas can we come up? We need to start thinking outside the box to see how we can enhance the existing protected areas and also promote communities from coming up with measures that are also going to promote conservation uh, of the species. Uh, additionally, the protected areas we have need to be made sustainable and made even more financially sustainable so that they can actually carry out these conservation measures even beyond challenges. We talked about the pandemic, the corona pandemic causing a challenge of um, diseases, uh, maybe infecting some of these animal diseases, but also there was a bigger challenge in that during the pandemic, many people lost their jobs and they resorted to bushmeat. So a lot of animals were killed in that period. And since there was no much, uh, the, our research efforts are very limited, we don't have adequate data, but some of these challenges, the lack of financial sustainability to manage our conservation areas is also posing a very big threat to conservation. So basically, uh, another area that we need to focus on is uh, protect uh, urban areas. As we talked about uh, uh, Diani urbanizing, Shimoni urbanizing, Mombasa is already urbanized. And uh, Mombasa, the biggest problem we've had to deal with is right now the, the primates that are found within Mombasa, they don't have a habitat actually. They are found in our estates and they are all over. And during the pandemic, maybe an incident that happened in Mombasa, we were forced as KWS. Uh, all the, all the, mon the, the, the monkeys or the primates actually congregated at the golf club in Nyali. And everybody was up in arms and we were supposed to be trapping those monkeys and moving them to Arabuko Sokoke. So it's, it's quite a challenge because during the pandemic, when the hotels closed down, the monkeys also, uh, uh, they missed out a source of food. So they started raiding homes in Yali, and they camped at the, at the golf course because there was a mango plantation there. So you can imagine it is also causing a big challenge to the urban areas, and it is potentially going to cause a lot of human wildlife conflict. And if it was a, a matter of spreading of zoonotic diseases, this will have had a very big impact on the human population in Mombasa. So uh, taking learning from this, we may need to come up with better measures to see how we are going to manage uh, urban ecosystems and how to sustain some of these uh, wildlife population. Lamu is urbanizing, we don't have those plans yet. Uh, or if you look at uh, Mombasa is already urbanized, but there's no wildlife management plan for, for that area. And Diani is coming out towards the same direction and so is Shimoni. So basically the entire coastline is developing at a very fast rate and yet very little attention or uh, efforts are being given to these uh, species on how we are going to conserve them and to ensure that they exist and for prosperity. Uh, uh, lastly, our commi commitment to actually enhance our conservation of uh, critical uh, terrestrial habitats to 30% by 2030, we are pro progressing well and it's good, but we need more efforts to secure corridors for wildlife so that when animals can easily move from one habitat to another, and this one also will help us secure 
uh, and prevent uh, human wildlife conflict scenarios. I would like to wrap up on that and uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity and listening to me. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mohammed, for the presentation. For the presentation. Uh, that brings us to the end of uh, our panelists' uh, presentation. And uh, quickly, I see in the chat box there are some uh, questions, some compliments. So uh, I will quickly scan through. Uh, we and then uh, the panelists will um, answer them as they come up. So uh, from Rupi Mangat, uh, she's saying, uh, yes, thanks to Solomon at Kipipiri who raised the red flag and was a lone ranger for many years. Uh, thank you, Rupi. Uh, John and Margaret Cooper, message from the Coopers, primate diversity and conservation in Kenya. Thank you all for an enjoyable webinar and updates on the situation in Kenya, our Nyumba Yapili. It was good to see friends and colleagues from the past, such as uh, Dr. Francis Gakuya and Dr. Masi Akini. Uh, okay, they will be back in Kenya from 20th of September and it looks forward uh, after two years of COVID restrictions. Looking forward to meeting a number of you and visiting both IPR, NMK and KMS. Best wishes. Thank you very much, um, John Cooper. Uh -huh. Thank you, Dr. Paul Casilli, for all the congratulations. Okay, uh, Pam, one of our panelists, saying uh, 24 years of conservation in five minutes. That was awesome. <laughs> okay, uh, from Deborah Nightingale. Wonderful presentations being delivered. Glad I got up at 5 a.m. to be here. We really have a long way to go though. Okay, there's a question from our end here. Thanks to the panelists from the, for the insightful presentations. What are some of the community approaches being applied towards primate conservation, especially where primates are being killed by humans due to raids on agricultural fields? Here's a question to the panelists. Hello. Can I say something about that? Yes, Dr. Mohamed, go ahead. Okay, you, you, the, the, the perception of primates in Kenya at the moment needs to be changed because most often uh, the primates are looked upon as vermin. Eh? It's like a pest. They, they are not given the prominence that they require. And um, most of the time when you talk of human wildlife conflict, the, the methods are used in is to scare them away, chase them away. But there's actually, I've not heard of any particular management strategy that is put in place to make sure that monkeys or the primates are actually uh, managed in a better way. That's why we need these uh, methods. We need to come up with this method as primate scientists or primate conservationists we may need to address these issues because if you look at uh, Diani Chale, if it wasn't for the Colobas Trust, uh, right now you'll not have any Colobas existing in Diani. At least, and the, the future of Colobas in Diani also needs to be looked at because um, at the moment, there's a lot of land use change, a lot of clearing of habitats, people are putting up houses, there's a lot of development. Uh, and if you look at all these plans that are being put in place, there's no actually prominence of primate conservation within that uh, the agenda. And uh, to, to make it um, even worse, maybe you may be surprised people are not even aware that the colobus is quite a charismatic species that is found in Diani. So I think it's something that we need to come up with uh, to help uh, communities to appreciate the importance of primates as uh, a part of our, our cultural uh, um, in, uh, heritage and also a part of our biodiversity wealth. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mohammed, for uh, that response. Uh, from Fanaka, wonderful presentation. Makes me think about habitat restoration and relocation of primates as a conservation strategy. Okay, from Kenneth. What's the status of the larger primates, gorillas, etc.? So 
I think I'm correct in saying that you've got the Sweetwater Sanctuary for chimpanzees in Kenya, but you don't have any native non-human great apes. You don't have the chimpanzees or the gorillas like you see in um, some other East African countries. So um, chimpanzees, gorillas and bonobos are not present, naturally occurring in Kenya. I don't know if they were historically, um, but I don't think these particular subspecies were ever here. With the moderator, can I comment? Yes, please do. Um, uh, thank you, Kim, for that. But I think maybe the question was so general whether they are endangered regardless to whatever they, they, they occur. Maybe you can respond to that. But I wanted to contribute to the first question where um, the, 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 it was asked about what, what strategies are available to a fat human wildlife conflict, especially where animals are being killed as crop raiders. And uh, let me start by saying one of, the, one of the approaches we need to embrace is actually raising the awareness among the local communities who are existing uh, with these uh, primates. Uh, because the reasons why the killings happen are different. Apart from crop raiding, we have seen primates being killed in hotels where they become problems. And I think Pam highlighted that very well when she was presenting the scenario at Diani. And I know they are doing a lot of awareness with the, hotel, with the hoteliers and other uh, residents within the area. So awareness is a very key thing. But where we have um, serious problems with crop raiding, I think uh, Nancy cited the relocation program, whereby uh, through the coordination by Fita Fundi, we, we moved some um, problem animals from Kipipiri to Karura, which is more Hindak uh, forest, and they are doing well. And the people now in Kipipiri are very happy growing their crops, even though we moved uh, part of their biodiversity from that area to, 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 to Karura. So, Translocations can be used as last resort where we don't see other, uh, other, other strategies moving. The other thing we should also understand why these animals have become so much a problem to crop uh, to, 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 to the local people, either by attacking people or crop raiding. We have seen areas where people start feeding monkeys. They become so wild and at times they attack. So we have to work with the local communities and discourage some of those uh, bad practices and uh, where the situation is really demanding, we can opt for, 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 for major approaches like relocation or translocation. Thank you. So just to add to Stan's point, I think it's important to know why primates are foraging on crops because it might be because they've got no habitat left, they've got no choice between feeding on people's crops or starvation, but it might also be that they actually crops are an easy to digest preferred food that offer quite high energy content. So I think before um, actually coming up with solutions, you need to understand each context and to why and why primates might need to forage on crops in the first place. Because actually species like colobus typically do aren't main crop foragers, unlike baboons, which might show a higher propensity to forage on crops because of their generalist feeding behavior. So I think understanding that's important too. Sorry for that. Uh, there's another concern. Thank you so much for the panel to the panelists for the fascinating and informative presentations. Do you think conservation programs are more successful when working closely with local communities or by implementing change at the regional or national level? And respond to that. Just um, a small point, at least for, I can only speak for Diani, but you know, with Diani supposedly being a city in our 2030 vision, uh, the, the building zoning needs to be re-looked at uh, for conservation 
people come to Diani because it is green, it is beautiful? Is it going to turn out to be a concrete jungle? And I don't think a lot has to change. I think some small things can, can change to make a big difference. Like for example, uh, we work with the roadside sellers of trees. And if, if we can get them to only sell indigenous tree species rather than Indian species or Australian species or South American species, this will go a long way to having some remnant of that, of that global biodiversity hotspot, that original forest. Um, making sure that plot size don't become so small. I think the earlier version of the, the zoning plan said that a certain proportion of the property, quite a large proportion of the property had to remain original or non-developed. Non so even if every, if every um, if every private property had one or two indigenous species growing on it, I I think that can make a um, can make a difference in the long term. Looking at corridors, um, yeah. So I, you know, I think if we get our you know get with the the county government and try to make some of these plans. Uh, the problem with colobus, if you lose your Diani population, you actually lose the entire population of Kuala of colobus, except for Shimba. Because between Shimba and Diani, those are the two main populations to hold the meta population. If you lose Diani, you're going to lose, uh, you'll lose the whole population, except uh, a remnant population in Shimba Hills. Yeah. Just to add on, if I may, um, I think Tan's Chamberlain's question on whether regional or, or local would work or community level would be best is, I think I did answer that question. It, it basically, I believe that both is necessary because as it is, the global level can only do so much or national level can only do so much. As you can see, it's not really working. <laughs> it's not as effective. Uh, people can only do so much at a, at, a, at a level, but what's going on on the ground is actually very well controlled, can be in, integrated to include communities. Like the example I gave with uh, the translocation project at, uh, from Kipipiri, where local communities themselves are the ones who are literally driving. Peter is coordinating and managing and logistic, but they're the ones who are telling him, this is where you should go. That's where they are very, you know, they're really causing problems and they've just had babies. So you need to, to you know, to translocate this number and this number. They're using local information and they've got a lot to gain by moving these primates. They don't want to see them go, but they are competing for the same resources and they don't want to see them go. At the same time, you know, socioeconomic, um, you know, uh, it does help with the such a common issues that are happening because of crop foraging. Uh, like Kim, I, I hate to, I do not like to use raiding, crop raiding, and I do not like to use, co uh, conflict is there sometimes. Yes, I agree with you. But raiding is, is all, what is termed as raiding is competition between primates and humans. And we're both trying to survive, yeah? Their natural foods are uh, slowly, uh, you know, diminishing because people are enroaching into their spaces. Actually, it's people enroaching into their spaces and clearing their, their uh, what they can use to survive. So in that sense, I think community is one of the key areas. As you saw, national interventions like parks, transboundary parks like Masai Mara and Serengeti are huge. This, these were actually created for wildebeest migration. They take so much space to allow for conserving and um, the heritage of Migrations for wildebeest, which is a phenomenon renowned, renowned wild, wild, wild. So, if in that sense, if Patas monkeys, for example, like the southern Patas monkeys, could not survive in parks like those and protected areas like that, obviously we need more than regional intervention or national intervention. We need community. That's that's my true belief. That the only way out to survive for these pockets of surviving species of uh, different you know, threatened or vulnerable um, primates is community intervention, 
where it needs to be integrated in, into the whole management system and planning. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nancy. Uh, there's a suggestion from Evershed. Human-related development is the leading cause of the declining employment numbers. Perhaps it is a high time ecologists run for public offices and be part of the table where development decisions are made. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. Okay, from Joshua Sese, the presentations were very amazing. Unfortunately, time moved too fast. Is it possible to have season two of such talks? Yes, we will we look into that and uh, plan for it. Uh, from David Kiragu, awesome and insightful presentations. Are there possibilities of utilizing non-invasive uh, genotyping protocols for, for ecological monitoring of primates as a way of generating both genetic data and demogra uh, demographic data from a conservation point of view? Yeah. Sure, I can, I can take that. Um, thank you for the question. So when we talk about non-invasive genotyping, this really means collection of stool samples. And a lot of times for um, especially the critically endangered uh, primate species and even in other locations, that's what most people do. They get the stool samples. And from the stool samples, you can infer things like um, the breeding status of particular populations. I think Nancy mentioned that there's a population that probably ended up being inbred and so they fizzled out. And so using um, this kind of genetic tools, you're able to tell um, what's the population structure. There are different markers that help you know how that looks like. So definitely non-invasive uh, techniques are good, not just for, um, ecological mo monitoring really, but also even for disease surveillance uh, as well. A lot of, uh, some of these diseases, you can pick them from stool samples, even COVID as well. A, lo a lot of the COVID that we get, even right now, some of, the, some of it has been picked from wastewater, which really has waste, uh, which is stool samples really. So yeah, new techniques are available for that. Hey, thank you, Dr. Masi, for, for the response. Uh, from Mohammed Sabit, it seems that people recently started living in close proximity to primate habitat have less tolerance towards primates coming to their places. Any advice to deal with this issue? Yes, uh, uh, I think we need to do a lot of awareness eh? because yeah. uh, you see, part of the problem we have at the, at the coast is that some of the communities that actually feed on, on primates for bushmeat, eh? uh, these are people like, uh, basically I came to learn that the Mediterranean actually practice that. And this, that's why you find that uh, in Kilifi, uh, the, the primate population, especially of the Mangabees, I mean the Colobas, was wiped out by the 70s. Eh? So, there's a problem we've uh, noticed, we've witnessed also uh, most of these primates when they venture into human uh, settlements here in some parts of the coast, they are targeted. Um, so we may need to do a lot of awareness uh, to the communities. Uh, and also there's a, there's a habit uh, for some communities at the coast keeping some of these uh, primates as pets. This is very common in Mombasa and in South Coast find somebody keeping them as pets when they are small, but when they become big, then uh, they become troublesome in the house, so they start pushing them away, they are left in the neighborhoods, so they cause a lot of chaos. And uh, so we, we may need to do a lot of awareness to the communities, and maybe uh, what we need to have as a policy in our urban areas is to set aside the green areas where these animals can actually get food. Because if you look at uh, our planning in Mombasa, most of our green areas are gone. We don't. Even uh, where we have a mangrove forest, even in Mombasa, the Chuda Creek, you find that the mangrove cover has declined by 80%. Right now, what we have in, as mangrove cover in Chuda Creek is only 20%. So basically, we've lost most of the habitats. So we need a lot of awareness. We need a lot of intervention when it comes to uh, planning, urban planning, land use planning. Uh, all those things must be done concurrently for you to address that issue. Uh, 
but it's, it's quite a big challenge and uh, the population uh, growth is quite high at the cost. And that is why the future of these uh, primates is really of importance that we need to really start addressing what are we going to do about. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mohamed, for, for the response. Uh, Charles Maingi, thank you, the presenters, very informative. Uh, Cheche, thank you for educative session. Susan Rose, we look forward to working with all partners involved to improve the status of primate conservation in Kenya. Thank you. Uh, Lenguya, uh, thank you all for such a fantastic presentation. Alex, thank you for all the, all the present, presenters. Uh, Tan, vets definitely play a role in one, in one health and managing disease. Is this the only way that can aid in conservation or can we do more to help? That's a good question. I think I'd be curious to hear what the other panelists think, think about it. But uh, generally from what I think and what people are now embracing as the One Health approach, it is time for people to work together. So the vets have to work with the anthropologists have to work with the disease uh, modeling experts, have to work with the conservationists. Uh, you know, like you have to work with multiple people. We are moving away where it's just one discipline that is, uh, that is uh, pushing the agenda for conservation. And it's now starting to become more of a multidisciplinary approach. And so I feel apart from just the managing of diseases and also just looking at um, the breeding across our populations, which again is more of a topic for uh, disease ecologists and population geneticists uh, and genomics people, right? So I, I, I think just having that knowledge of um, what are the predictors of diseases and what are the current diseases that are going on and working with all groups to uh, kind of give thoughts on how to mitigate uh, developing threats is, is, is good enough, but I'd be curious if anyone has more ways uh, on how we can participate in the conservation um, avenue. So just specifically for great apes, I know that there are um, uh, vet, vets contribute to removing snares and dealing with these kind of threats. So um, very active, especially in kind of mounting gorilla snare injuries and removing snares and yeah, contributing in that way. But Maybe to add on that, uh, what, what Doc, um, Doc Masi and Kimberly have said, uh, I think there is a big niche for vets when it comes to conservation and particularly trying to provide interventions to addressing the problems affecting the, fri uh, the primates. One of the things which I mentioned as a challenge and a driver of the primates towards extinction is actually human wildlife conflict. And one of the offered uh, interventions is translocations. When it comes to translocations, uh, I think the role of vet is very well cut. So we definitely need to work people who understand how to mobilize animals and how we can best them move them from one place to another. The other thing is uh, someone suggested that we also need to address things like uh, genetic technology in in, in, in offering solutions to primate conservation. Again, if you look at that, sometimes we may need to do whole genomic of different primates to understand their taxonomy. In that case, still you need a vet. Diseases are actually another major driver of primates towards extinction. We need to do frequent uh, disease surveillance in the world and vets also come to play in that thing, uh, in that way. But overall, to address the problems of vecting primates, we need a multidisciplinary approach where we need cultural anthropologists, where we need uh, even medical doctors, where we need um, people working in the agricultural sector, we need the government uh, people, the policy makers, because we have to develop action plans for the threatened ones, management and conservation guidelines for those we think are abundant, but probably they are causing trouble to people. So, I mean, like it's a mild disciplinary approach and I, I'm very sure everybody will find a niche in trying to address issues of primate conservation.
Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, for interest of time, we'll actually we'll be scanning through some more few questions then uh, we bring the session to a close. And then uh, I will also encourage uh, the, uh, the panelists, if you could uh, share your contacts through the chat box so that uh, all the participants who will need more details from you can uh, reach out to you later. Uh, from uh, Dr. Omwenga from NEMA, primates are the main hindrance to riparian zones restoration. They are viewed as a threat to maize farming. Riparian zones are home to those primates. Neighbors to Maragoli too have fears concerning the restoration of Maragoli Hills Forest, concern be, uh, concerning being primates and associated crop destructions. What's the future of primates? Anyone who would like to touch on that? Okay. Let's just scan through another one. Uh, uh, the... Yes, sorry. Peter? Am I around to say something? Yes, please do. Um... Well, uh, I, I was a co-panelist, and uh, thanks to uh, Dr. Mwega, uh, because uh, I believe uh, uh, when it comes to uh, river and ecosystems restoration, uh, primates will play a key role. Remember, they, they are viewed as uh, seed dispersers. They play a very key role in seed dispersal. So uh, in terms of forest regeneration, yes, they play a key role. Uh, if uh, I have an example of a, a community I'm working with uh, uh, down at uh, in Anyuki, actually the restoration of uh, onto Rili River is being driven by uh, primate conservation because they feel they can benefit more by uh, having this river ecosystem uh, restored. They can benefit more by having this monkey there. Uh, unlike farming maize, which is failing, but they can now tap into uh, primates and maybe have um, something like primate tourism in this ecosystem. So apart from uh, the traditional farming and uh, uh, with these unpredictable weather, uh, I think uh, uh, primate conservation can now uh, have an alternative, uh, uh, maybe, a uh, source of livelihood uh, in Kenya. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you for that uh, input, uh, Peter. Uh, still going through uh, maybe two more concerns in the, in the chat box and then we bring it to an end. Uh -huh. From Joshua Wambugu, should translocation always be a solution to count, counter human primate conflict? The case of Kipipiri agro ecosystems where human primate was evidence was triggered by local communities engaging in shift cultivation of farming in the Malewa River Valley. In my opinion, river and forest rehabilitation and community awareness would have provided a better solution. What does the panel feel about that? So I'm certainly not a translocation expert, but talking more broadly about translocations, I think um, one a very important point is that you need to ensure where you're translocating animals to it has to be um, free from human uh, human issues as well. And it's very difficult, especially with species with large home ranges, to find those areas now where primates aren't already existing. And actually, yeah, in the case of translocation, you have to be careful. You're if there are um, existing primate populations there that you're not introducing disease, um, you're not introducing problematic animals that would go and crop forage near them. And I think from Kenya, I can just think of some of Shirley Strum's very interesting early work on translocations as a result of you know, high conflict between um, humans and primates. But I think there are so many factors that need to be considered before translocations anywhere in the world. Um, and uh, Certainly, if you've got other alternatives, such as forest regeneration, um, working with lo local communities, and you think those can work, I think they should be explored before anything else. 
Yeah, um, if I may add uh, to what Kim just said, I think you have to look at the situation at hand. Uh, for the for these uh, Mount Kenya colobus, they were already like literally sitting in isolated patches of trees that were not enough to sustain them and were forced to go and crop raid. And if you start thinking about a re restoration plan then, it takes a while, yeah? It's more of an immediate, um, uh, you know, strategy, management strategy, when it's needed right then, because leaving them and waiting for restoration to happen, they would have died by then. They would have gone locally extinct from that area. So it needs a plan, especially when you know, like, it's a, the previous question actually, actually relates to this as well. When you're talking about specific areas like river and forest, I know there are some bylaws about where rivers are that you could not cultivate a uh, certain distance to the river or even the lake or whatever. They are there, but they're not enforced, yeah? Whether, um, where there are rivers, but many of these rivers are actually also dry and are seasonal. So people have taken opportunity to come and plant because the soils there are very, you know, alluvial soils are very good, but it's also where these primates stay. And by doing that, they clear this forest. And it's it can become political if you start talking about restoration when people already moved in. So it, it, it needs sort of like a management strategy where people, policymakers, researchers, primatologists who have an idea like, you know, like what the, the Dubrazo monkeys in Transoya along the river and forest, where so many forests have been cleared. For example, uh, indigenous trees have been cleared and instead have eucalyptus trees where these animals did not, you know, ecological useful for them apart from resting and sleeping, yeah? So there's some things that can be actually put into place like when clearing maybe river and forest should not be cleared completely or something where they're still existing or maybe replant in a forest rate them. But those take time and it needs a plan where, as I said, national, regional, and community to work together to do so. But it takes time. And this translocation is not the only solution. It's just an immediate solution for something that needs to be done immediately, really. Yeah. OK. Uh, thank you, Dr. Nancy, for, for, for the response. And uh, now, to bring uh, close uh, Actually, to bring us to the end of all the questions that have been raised up, I see Pam here has something that maybe also the audience would want to know, like, where do you translocate primates to that won't affect another community? It seems like in Kenya, everybody says, oh, why don't we translocate them to Savo? <laughs> and, I get, and I get a bit worried about that. I'm wondering what Savo is going to look like. <laughs> all sorts of animals inside it. Um, we, when we look at release sites, um, even in Shimba Hills, Sykes monkeys are supposed to be, and Barbat monkeys are supposed to be seven kilometers from, from an edge. Yeah, you can't even get that in Shimba Hills. So when people say, oh, why don't you just translocate them? It's, it's, it's not ethical to translocate a group that is going to cause problems for another human community. So, um, I mean, we're, we're in trouble, we're, we're in trouble. So, so we really need to think of some innovative ways to move forward. Of course, um, the more policy makers on these kind of presentations, uh, the better. You know, it's, it's kind of like preaching to the converted here. Uh, you know, we're all interested in primates, we're all interested in primate conservation, but where are all the governors? Where, are, you know, where, is, where are our MPs? Those are the people that we need to get on the session two, I think somebody, season two is what somebody called it. So it would be really nice to have our policymakers here so we can discuss, discuss these issues with them because ultimately they're the ones that are going to frame what we can and can't do. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for that. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, thank you very much for joining us. It has been a very informative, very interactive and educative uh, talk that uh, our presenters have given us. And uh, also their contacts have been shared through the chat box. Would you like to engage with them further about uh, their respective topics? You can always reach them uh, through uh, 
email. Thank you very much. Uh, we will be uploading and uh, sharing this uh, presentation in our YouTube, Nature Kenya YouTube uh, channel. You can always visit there, subscribe, and uh, hit on the notification bell because all our talks are uploaded in there. So thank you very much. Uh, it's about uh, 10 minutes to six o'clock, about one hour past our schedule, but it has been uh, fruitful. It has been uh, very engaging. Thank you very much and uh, have a great evening ahead. And uh, we can leave at our own pleasure. Maybe the panelists, you can still remain behind for a while. Thank you very much for organizing this. It was really helpful. Thank you. We yeah, appreciate yeah. it. And thank you all for attending. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you.